Royal couples who are really in love. Thank you to Forio for sponsoring this video. Through most of history, royals had very little choice about who they married. Princes were pushed down the aisle with the daughter of whichever king their father wanted a treaty with. And after doing their royal duty, they often gave their time, attention, and sometimes the royal jewels to their mistresses. Meanwhile, princesses were carted off to foreign lands where they might not speak the language to live a lonely life of bearing the children of a man who ignored them at best, openly despised them at worst. But this was not always the case. Sometimes after getting through the awkward wedding night, royal spouses found they had a lot in common and formed intimate, passionate, and lifelong connections. Some kings even ignored the court ladies clamoring to be their mistresses and had eyes only for their queens. From a medieval queen who rode into war at her husband's side, to a Renaissance emperor who trusted his wife to rule, from a queen who risked death to continue sleeping with her husband, to a princess who was betrothed to the heir but ended up happy with a spare. While these monarchs may have been Fabio in the bedchamber, they were far from flawless. Some were cruel and violent towards their enemies and even their own people, but they prove that happily ever after really can come true, at least until a lack of medical knowledge came in to turn their Julia Quinn bodice rippers into Nicholas Sparks tragedies. Let's meet four royal couples who were brought together by arranged marriages, but ended up falling in love. Whether there's love in the air or you're all about self-care, one always feels one's best with healthy, well-hydrated skin. Back in the Renaissance, Isabella of Portugal had to resort to lead paint to achieve that clear, fair complexion. And in the 1800s, Maria of Portugal might have pampered her skin with a mask of lemon juice and pig fat. Fortunately today, we have vastly improved innovations for achieving that fresh-faced, fully hydrated look. It's the UFO3 by Foreo Sweden. You simply select the mask you want to use. Make my day is perfect to perk me up in the morning. And call it a night is so relaxing for bedtime. But today, I'm going to go with Manuka Honey to give my skin deep hydration from the cold, dry weather. I just insert the mask into the device and follow the instructions on the app to gently apply the mask to my face and neck. The UFO3 offers cooling cryotherapy to firm up wrinkles and puffiness, warming thermotherapy to help your skin absorb the wrinkle-banishing active ingredients, full-spectrum LED wavelength color to refine your complexion, and T-Sonic massage to gently relax facial muscles and boost circulation. It's so relaxing, I feel like a pampered princess in my very own palace. After using my UFO3 for the past few months, my skin feels supple, healthy, and glows brighter than a diamond tiara. Click the link in the description to get 30% off the UFO3 by Foria Sweden, and use my exclusive discount code to get an extra 10% off. And now, back to history. King Edward I of England and Eleanor of Castile. Prince Edward had all the makings of a great warrior king. At six foot two, he towered over his contemporaries. His lanky arms gave him an advantage as a swordsman. His long thighs meant he was a natural astride a horse. And his curly blonde hair shone like a crown. Edward adored the tales of King Arthur and Camelot and envisioned himself as a romantic, chivalrous knight. All he needed was a Guinevere. His parents, Henry III and Eleanor of Provence, who were themselves deeply devoted, arranged for their 15-year-old son to wed the 13-year-old sister of Alfonso X of Castile. The prince traveled to Spain, where he wed Princess Eleanor at the monastery of Las Huelas. The newlywed strangers endured the awkward bedding ceremony, during which the entire drunken court escorted them to bed. Once left alone, they had a chance to talk. Edward didn't speak Spanish, and Eleanor had not yet learned English. 
but they both spoke French. Eleanor had an oval face, almond eyes, and thick, wavy dark hair. And she was intelligent, well-educated, and ambitious like her groom. The newlyweds spent their first year in Gascony. While Edward asserted English rule there, he and Eleanor spent their free time listening to minstrels, playing chess, and reading. He introduced her to the tales of King Arthur, and she was enthralled. Though young, Eleanor gave birth to a daughter, who sadly died shortly after birth. After this tragedy, Edward took his bride home to England. His father was famous for his largesse, and many of Eleanor's kin followed her there to leech off her father-in-law. She was too young to stop them, but she was blamed by the overtaxed English. Londoners rioted, and Baron Simon de Montford captured both the king and Prince Edward and held them prisoner. But he underestimated teenage Eleanor. She held Windsor Castle for her husband and wrote to her parents requesting troops from Castile. But before they arrived, Edward was able to give his guards the slip and escape. He raised an army and attacked de Montford, killing and dismembering him. He restored his father to the throne, but he became the real power and reformed the government. To thank his wife for her loyalty and courage, he took her on the medieval version of a vacation, crusade. While in the Holy Lands, the Sultan of the Baybars attempted to assassinate Edward, and he was slashed in the arm with a poisoned dagger. According to legend, his devoted wife sucked the poison from his arm and saved his life. Their campaign was unsuccessful, and they returned home just in time for the death of King Henry. Edward and Eleanor were crowned in a joint coronation in 1274. They embarked on a PR campaign to once again endear the monarchy to the people. They wanted to be seen as the new Arthur and Guinevere, and they conducted a ceremony in which they placed bones said to belong to the King and Queen of Camelot in a magnificent new tomb. Now in their 30s, the couple who had grown up together had an unbreakable bond. They enjoyed each other's company and had a playful, humorous relationship. In the Middle Ages, Christians refrained from meat, alcohol, and sex during the 40 days of Lent. On Easter Monday, Edward let Eleanor's ladies hold him captive, and he paid them each a ransom so he would be allowed to enter his wife's room. Edward had eyes only for Eleanor. He is one of the few English monarchs who was faithful to his wife and sired no illegitimate children. Eleanor herself had 16 babies, though only six survived. While Edward was gentle and loving towards his family, he was brutally ambitious. He conquered Wales and spiked the Welsh prince's head on the Tower of London, and he taxed the Jewish people and eventually expelled them from the country to pay for it all. Eleanor was with him every step of the way. She joined him on campaign, often roughing it in military camps. She gave birth to her youngest son, Prince Edward, in a tent while Carnarfon Castle was being constructed around her. When they were not at war, Eleanor wanted a place to get away from it all. She purchased Leeds Castle and transformed it into a luxury fantasy Camelot. The stylish queen imported Spanish luxuries, including carpets, tapestries, glazed windows, and forks. Unlike many English nobles, Eleanor was fond of bathing. She built a bathhouse with tiled walls and piped in water, and she and Edward spent many happy hours there. But the demands of ruling so much land saw the couple back on the road again. Eleanor's health was compromised by so many pregnancies and near constant travel. She caught malaria and never fully recovered. For three years, she dwindled. In 1290, the royal progress was stopped, and the dying queen was placed in the bed of a knight in his home outside of Lincoln. Eleanor breathed her last, surrounded by her children and husband of 36 years. Edward was devastated. He ordered her body to be embalmed and carried back to London. At every step along the two-week journey, he ordered that a memorial cross be erected. These 12 stone monuments were massive, intricately carved with likenesses of the late queen and the saints, and covered in vivid paint and gold leaf. Only three survive today. 
Edward also ordered two gold effigies of his beloved wife. One was placed in Westminster Abbey and one in Lincoln Cathedral. The widower would have been content to spend the rest of his life alone, morphing into the bitter old man depicted in Braveheart. However, only one of he and Eleanor's four sons had survived her. The king needed a spare, so he agreed to wed Margaret of France. He was 62 and she 20. It may not have been the great meeting of souls he had with Eleanor, but Margaret calmed the cantankerous old king, and they found some happiness and had three children before he died at 68. The 26-year-old widow never remarried. She remarked, when Edward died, all men died for me. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and Isabella of Portugal Charles was the result of unions between several powerful and related families. His mother Juana was the daughter of Isabel of Castile and Fernando of Aragon, the powerful Spanish monarchs who united Spain and sent Christopher Columbus out to colonize the New World. His father, Philip the Handsome, was the son of Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I and Mary, Duchess of Burgundy, one of the wealthiest heiresses in Europe whose dowry was the Netherlands. Charles inherited it all, becoming the head of a vast empire by the age of 18. He was a frail young man, suffered from epilepsy, and was one of the first monarchs to inherit the now infamous Habsburg jaw. He was also intelligent, mature, responsible, and inspired loyalty in his family and ministers. They recommended he marry a Portuguese princess, but the young monarch was not keen to settle down. He agreed to wed his cousin, Mary, the daughter of his aunt, Catherine of Aragon, and of Henry VIII of England. There was no rush to the altar because she was only six. However, a few years later, the now 25-year-old emperor grew tired of waiting to sire an heir, so he canceled the English engagement and instead agreed to wed Isabella of Portugal. She was only three years his junior and an alliance with the world's second greatest navy meant Spain and Portugal could carve up the new world and share it. Plus, Isabella came with a massive dowry which included the Canary Islands. When she arrived in Seville, she had to wait a week for her groom to show up. He intended to stay only a short while, long enough to get her pregnant, before leaving for the Holy Roman Empire. But the diligent young ruler dropped all his plans when he finally met Isabella. He was captivated by her beautiful, fine, fair features, blue eyes, and wavy auburn hair, and charmed by her intelligence, kindness, and good humor. Charles insisted that they be wed that very night in a small ceremony just after midnight. He canceled his travel plans and stayed with her for months while they enjoyed a happy honeymoon at the Alhambra in Granada. Isabella admired red carnations from Persia. Charles ordered millions to be planted across Spain. The red carnation became Spain's floral emblem. Charles remained with his wife for three years, and she delivered three children, but eventually the demands of running a massive empire encroached on their bliss. Charles kissed Isabella goodbye and rode off to Central Europe for three years. He left her in charge as regent of Spain. She missed her husband dearly, but she did not struggle to run the country in his absence. She attended council meetings, traveled the country, and took an active role in policymaking. She was an expert in economics, and under her leadership, Spain grew wealthy. When Charles returned, he was heartily impressed. He continued to come and go, remaining for a few months or years, then departing again. While he was away, Isabella wrote him daily, and she sometimes had to wait months to receive replies from far-flung battlefields. All the while, she ran Spain and oversaw the upbringing of their children. While Charles was on the road, he had no concern for other women. He was faithful to his wife throughout their 13-year marriage. In 1539, Isabella contracted a fever while pregnant with her seventh child. The baby was stillborn and the 35-year-old empress never recovered. She died three weeks later without her husband. 
Charles was so devastated and guilty that he had not been by her side that he locked himself in a monastery for two months to pray for her soul. For the rest of his life, he dressed in black and refused to remarry. He commissioned Titian to paint numerous posthumous portraits of his beloved, and he made sure that there was an image of her wherever he traveled. By 56, his depression and gout were debilitating. The emperor leaned on his advisors and wept while he announced his abdication, handing Spain to his son, Philip II, and the empire to his brother, Ferdinand I. Charles spent his last two years in a Spanish monastery, surrounded by clocks and portraits of his dead wife. He staged a production of his own funeral, then rose from his coffin and went to have lunch. His only desire was to be reunited with Isabella in heaven. He died at the age of 58. One of the most famous royal romances in history was that of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. In fact, I dedicated an episode to the great lovers on Valentine's Day 2020. But as their romance has been pretty thoroughly covered, let me tell you the story of another 19th century queen regnant, born just one month before Victoria, who married Prince Albert's first cousin and also had a joyful marriage, lots of babies, and a tragic early parting. Queen Maria II of Portugal and Prince Ferdinand of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. Maria was born in 1819 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Her father Pedro had rebelled against his father, left for Brazil, and declared its independence with himself as emperor. His younger brother, Miguel, had also rebelled and then been exiled to Austria. When King João VI died, there was a succession crisis as he had not said which treacherous son should succeed him, liberal Pedro or absolutist Miguel. Pedro came up with a solution. He renounced his own claim to Portugal in favor of his seven-year-old daughter, Maria. She would travel back to Europe and, when she was old enough, marry her uncle Miguel who agreed to accept the liberal constitution and rule as regent until Maria came of age. But as soon as the young queen's toes touched Portuguese soil, her uncle deposed her and took her throne for himself. For six years, while civil war raged, the young ex-queen traveled to London, Vienna, and was educated in Paris. Meanwhile, her father returned to Portugal to defeat his brother and secure his daughter's throne. Once the job was done, he called 15-year-old Maria back to Lisbon and promptly died of tuberculosis. The teenage queen married Prince Auguste, Duke of Leichenberg, Empress Josephine's eldest grandson, but he fell ill and died two months after the wedding. The widowed queen had barely gotten to know her handsome husband, but her courtiers were anxious that she produce an heir and avoid the succession wars they just emerged from. So she consented to a second marriage, to Ferdinand of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. He was a first cousin to Prince Albert, who, four years later, would marry Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom. Both German princes were handsome, cultured, intelligent, capable, and had fine manners. Ferdinand was artistic and enjoyed making pottery and painting with watercolors. As was customary, the couple were wed by proxy and didn't meet in person until it was too late to back out. Luckily, they hit it off right away. Maria told a friend, it seems that I already like him without knowing him. He will be as dedicated to the happiness of the Portuguese nation as to mine. By the 19th century, betting ceremonies were out, so the wedding night went off without a hitch. The next year, Maria went into labor. Though it was prolonged and excruciating, both she and baby Pedro emerged from the ordeal. In accordance with Portuguese law, after the birth of an heir, Ferdinand was granted the title King Consort. Though Maria held the reins of power, she often consulted him before making difficult decisions, and they were usually of one mind on the issues. She was an enlightened monarch and introduced more education to her people. She also advocated for public health acts, which helped curb the spread of cholera and saved thousands of lives. Her benevolence towards her people earned her the nickname, the Good Mother. 
she also became a mother in the more traditional sense, many times over. Maria and Ferdinand's passionate relationship in an era before reliable birth control resulted in 12 pregnancies over 17 years. The parents were as devoted to their seven surviving children as they were to each other. They enjoyed spending time reading to their offspring and being outside in nature. Ferdinand often picked flowers for his wife, and when her royal duties took her away, he wrote her tender love letters. They also enjoyed going to the opera and theater together. Ferdinand purchased a dilapidated monastery in the Sintra Mountains and set out to rebuild it as a retreat for his family. Maria often had complications during her pregnancies and labors. Four of her babies died during delivery and were baptized in utero. Over time, this took a toll on her health. The queen became obese and developed a heart condition. Her doctors warned her against more children, but the only way to avoid that was to avoid her husband's affections, something she was unwilling to do. The queen answered, if I die, I die at my post. Prince Albert had a similar effect on his own wife, Queen Victoria. There must have been something about those Coburg men. Had Victoria not heeded her own doctor's warnings and stopped at nine babies, she too might have suffered Maria's fate. During her 11th childbirth, the baby was unable to emerge. While her lady climbed in the bed next to her and Ferdinand looked on in helpless anguish, doctors operated without anesthesia, but the surgery was unsuccessful. Exhausted, Queen Maria rested her head on the pillow and breathed her last. She was 34. Her stillborn son was baptized Eugenio. Ferdinand wept uncontrollably and embraced her lifeless body. He became regent to their 16-year-old son, Pedro V, but without his dear wife, he lived in bitterness. He completed the spectacular Pena Palace, but was heartbroken that Maria hadn't lived to enjoy it. Eight years after her death, his cousin, Prince Albert, died of typhoid fever, and Queen Victoria lost the great love of her life. She and Ferdinand bonded over their shared grief. In a letter to the British Queen, he wrote, These great affections, when broken, leave a terrible void and a pain that is difficult to heal. Tsar Alexander III of Russia and Princess Dagmar of Denmark Princess Dagmar grew up a minor royal in a relatively modest home. She and her two sisters learned to cook and sew their own clothes, while their three brothers joined the navy. But everything changed when their distant cousin, King Frederick VII of Denmark, died childless and their father unexpectedly became King Christian IX. The family moved into Amalienborg Palace, but remained down to earth. Their mother, Louise, had an undeniable talent for matchmaking. She was able to pair her beautiful daughters with the most eligible royal bachelors. Eldest sister Alexandra married Edward, Prince of Wales. They got on well enough, despite his 50-plus mistresses. The black sheep, Tora, had a joyful union with the equally eccentric Ernst August, Crown Prince of Hanover. But perhaps the greatest match of all was that of middle sister, Dagmar, to Nikolai, the Tsarevich of Russia. The 20-year-old heir to the throne was handsome, charming, intelligent, and enjoyed writing poetry. He had seen photographs of Princess Dagmar and become quite enchanted with her. He was also impressed with her voracious appetite for books and ability to teach herself languages. When the pair first met, the feeling was mutual. They became engaged and used a diamond to scratch their initials in a window in the Summer Palace. She utilized her gift for languages to learn Russian and the couple exchanged letters daily while Nikolai toured Southern Europe. Suddenly, Dagmar received a telegram from the Tsar that his son was in Nice and terribly ill with meningitis. She raced to Nikolai's bedside and arrived just in time to wish him a tearful farewell. The dying Tsarevich asked that his younger brother, Alexander, who was about to become heir, take Dagmar's hand in marriage. 
Alexander was not nearly as handsome or intelligent as his brother. He stood six foot three and was awkward physically and socially. He was also infatuated with his mother's lady-in-waiting and wanted to renounce the throne to marry her. But his parents insisted that he go to Denmark and meet Dagmar. While he was there, the two looked at pictures of Nikolai together. He asked if she could love him after loving his brother, and she replied that she could love no one but him because he had been so close to his brother. They both burst into tears. During his two-month visit, he forgot about the lady-in-waiting and proposed to Dagmar. The 18-year-old princess bid her family farewell and traveled to Russia. She converted to orthodoxy and took the name Maria Fyodorovna. The couple married in extravagance at the Winter Palace. Alexander wrote in his diary of their wedding night, I took off my slippers and my silver embroidered robe and felt the body of my beloved next to mine. How I felt then, I do not wish to describe here. Afterward, we talked for a long time. The newlyweds were swept into a marathon of glittering balls celebrating their nuptials. A young composer, Tchaikovsky, wrote new music for their arrival in Moscow. Maria found the Russian court formal and stiff compared to her relaxed upbringing in Denmark, but she had an easy nature and adapted. Her husband, whom she affectionately called Sasha, doted on her. A year into their marriage, she gave birth to their first child, Nikolai. Five more children followed. Alexander, a famously stern man, was gentle and loving with his family. He enjoyed playing games and ice skating with his children. He was incredibly strong and ripped decks of cards in half and bent horseshoes to entertain them. And every year he commissioned a new egg from artist Carl Fabergé for his wife. But outside the palace all was not well. Serfdom and social injustice plagued Russia, and the luxurious lifestyle of the Romanovs incited fury. A bomb was detonated in the dining room of the Winter Palace, and had the family not been running late for dinner, they would all have been killed. In 1881, Tsar Alexander II's carriage was bombed. Maria and the family bid the dying Tsar farewell, and Maria was horrified to see that his legs had been blown to pieces. In these terrifying circumstances, Alexander and Maria were crowned Tsar and Tsarina of Russia. Fearing for their safety, they moved out of the sumptuous winter palace and into the more secure but dreary and cramped Gachin Palace. Balls and social gatherings were canceled. But the attempts on their lives continued. The family's train was derailed, and six-year-old Olga was thrown out the window. The Tsar used his immense strength to hold up the train's roof so his family could escape, and they all survived. They took respite each summer in Denmark, where they could relax with Maria's family. At 49, after 28 years of happy marriage, the Tsar fell ill with kidney disease. He and Maria tried to travel to Greece, where it was hoped that he would recover, but they had to stop in Crimea, and the emperor died in his wife's arms. Maria was desolate. Her older sister, Alexandra, made haste from London to be with her. She remained with Maria day and night for two weeks during the whirlwind of the funeral and her son Nikolai's wedding. Maria lived another 34 years, the Dowager Empress held a prominent place at court and cared dearly for her grandchildren. She and Alexandra bought a villa together outside of Copenhagen. When the Russian Revolution broke out in 1917, Maria took her daughters and fled to Crimea. There she was informed that her son, Nikolai, and his family had been murdered. Bolsheviks advanced on Crimea, and Alexandra sent a British warship to rescue her. Maria spent her final years in Denmark and died at the age of 80 in 1928. In 2006, her body was exhumed and returned to Russia. She was laid to rest in St. Peter and Paul Cathedral next to her beloved, Sasha. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos.
If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.